I'm Katrina Volder. This is the Practical Ethics Channel. Maybe it's possible for people to resist, and there's, you know, there's a question as to how difficult something has to be before you think it's not really possible for someone. But it's very difficult. So we should give them an environment where they don't have to be struggling against that, where they don't have to be trying to, to control it in the ways that, that they have to do so. This is part two of my interview with Richard Holton, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Cambridge. Professor Holton just gave the EU Hero Lectures here at the University of Oxford. The theme was Illness and the Social Self. He talked about dementia, addiction and psychosomatic disorders. This video focuses on addiction. Dementia and psychosomatic disorders are addressed in separate videos on the Practical Ethics channel. So now I would like to move on to addiction. Right. Is addiction a pathology, so something addicted people cannot escape from? Or is it more like um, any other behaviour where people actually do have the possibility to control it? A lot of the, the discussions are split between those two views. So both in the, in the scholarly literature and in the, the applied discussions of it. So you do get some people saying, look, this is just behaviour like any other. And they cite various bits of evidence for that. You know, if the cost of drugs goes up, the consumption levels go down, even amongst addicts. So to that extent, it looks like normal consumer behaviour. On the other hand, you have people who think of it very much on a disease model. And they say things like, well, you know, you, you can't explain this just to do with costs. So look at someone who's just been through withdrawal. Once they've come through withdrawal, they should realise just how awful it was going through it. They should realise how bad it was having been taking the drugs before. And yet that's the point at which they're most vulnerable to becoming addicted again. So it looks as though there's something going on there which isn't simply a, a sort of cost-benefit analysis, rational choice on the part of the, of the agent. Ken Berridge and... Uh, and Robinson, Berridge and Robinson in, in, at the University of Michigan have got a lot of very interesting studies looking at the ways in which addiction involves something going wrong with the dopamine system. There looks to be a dissociation between wanting and liking. So if you interfere with a rat's dopamine system, you can get it to the state where if you were to give it food, it would show a pleasure response that food it's hungry it seems to like it but it's not motivated to get it so because you've you've cut down the the dopamine response there so that's a creature which is liking something or potentially liking it but not trying to get it so in that sense not wanting it and addiction looks to be the sort of flip side of that addiction looks to be a case where it's the wanting system that's really gone out of control there may be liking, and typically with most of the addictive drugs there is liking. I mean, most people enjoy at least to begin with the drugs that they're taking. But it's not the liking that's really driving the behaviour. The behaviour is being driven by the wanting system. So to that extent, it's a pathology. It's, it's a disease. I mean, uh, something's gone, something has gone wrong with the, with the agent. But of course, what's gone wrong there is to do with the wanting, and that doesn't immediately lead into the behaviour. So you have cravings. This is one of the things that addiction is, is, is full of, cravings provoked by the cues which are associated with those drugs. But those cravings don't automatically lead to behaviour because we do have some abilities to control them. And that's the extent to which I think you've got something more like intentional behaviour is to do with the controlling of those, of, those, um, of those cravings. So I think we shouldn't really be looking at this stark contrast between thinking this is fully intentional behaviour, therefore, you know, there's no excuse, or it's a disease, it's outside the control of the agent, there's no responsibility. I think the truth is somewhere in between, and it's in between because what's out of the control of the agent is the other cravings. What's to some degree within their control, only as a result of very hard work, is some ability to, to rein in those cravings insofar as they're not taken in, into action. So in the case of dementia, where the people around the person with dementia who have an important role to play. So who has an important role to play when it comes to tackling an addiction? So, uh, I mean, there are, there are many places where, where there's, there's, there's a role to play, but the, the one I've been most focused on is this idea that 
Addictive behavior is typically cue-driven behavior, that is, the cravings come as a result of being cued in the appropriate way. Some of the responsibility, I think, then falls on the people who are providing the environment that gives rise to that cue. I think for sort of illegal drugs, we all think that, right? We think that the drug pusher has as much responsibility, if not more, than the addict for, you know, bringing the drugs there. And that's been the focus of criminal um, responsibility for, for many years. Where I think we've, we think less about this is when we look at areas where there isn't quite the same notion of addiction in that it's not that the dopamine system has been directly interfered with, as we find happens with the addictive drugs. But in cases where the dopamine system is nonetheless responding to cues. So one of the interesting things there, if you've got this dissociation between wanting and liking, you also find this dissociation between wanting and your judgments about whether it's a good thing or not. Right? Once the cue is there, you get the wanting even if you believe this is a stupid thing to do. Right? You see that in addiction all the time. But it may well be that something like sugar um, is using the same mechanism, it's just not using it it hasn't come to be sensitized in quite the same way that, that you get that with, um, with the addictive, with the clearly addictive drugs. But nonetheless, the outcome is rather similar. Right? People see the cues, they see the, the cakes and the soft drinks and the sweets and the things around them, and they respond to those cues with desires which are, to some degree, independent of their views about whether this is a good thing to take or not. That means, I think, that we should think of those cues as something like a, a polluted environment. So in just the same way that you might think that someone who sends smoke out and affects people's lungs because the people are there breathing it in and that has that impact, we should think there's the same kind of thing. If you put you know, soft drinks available where people can't avoid seeing them, then that's a bit like sending the smoke across. You trigger the people, you cue them, and much more likely to consume. So I think once we think that way, then we've got a way of realising why the sorts of things which governments are starting to think about doing, namely you know, putting taxes on, on soft drinks, restricting bottle sizes, restricting perhaps the places where they are available. I mean, that's not to ban them. I don't think we should be in the business of banning these things, and I think if we try to do that, it's, you know, it's, it's not going to work anyway. But these more subtle interventions where you just try to make sure that it's not an environment which is constantly queuing people, I think is something which could be justified in much the same way that we think we should have environments that don't allow smoke or whatever. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe to the Practical Ethics channel. 